Welcome to a special six-part series from Talking Volumes, hosted by me, Ewan Russell, and me, Ruben J. Brown. In 2019, we both made applications for degrees in architecture, receiving offers from universities including UCL's Bartlett School, Sheffield, and Edinburgh. And in the autumn of 2020, we're both hoping to take up offers at Cambridge University. In comparison to applying for most undergrad degrees, this is a pretty intensive process. And when we were going through it, we both struggled to find simple answers to some confusing questions. Questions like, what should I apply for? What should go in my portfolio? And how should it be presented? Do I need work experience? Do I need to be able to draw? And how? We know that if you're listening to this, you're excited about architecture and want the best chance to get into the best school for you. So we've made this series, which will tell you everything you need to know about applying to study architecture in the UK from a student's perspective. We've got six episodes covering where to start, what to apply for, writing a personal statement, making your portfolio, application drawing tasks, and finally, what to expect at an interview. You're listening to episode five, Drawing Tasks. After you apply through UCAS, lots of universities will send you a drawing task to complete, or you might have to do one at interview. These can take lots of different forms, but they all focus on how you can think and communicate visually. In this way, they're assessing similar things to a portfolio, and some universities might ask for a drawing task instead of a portfolio, or vice versa, or both. Being able to draw and translate 3D space onto paper is an important skill for architecture school. This doesn't mean that you have to be incredible at drawing photorealistic, complex perspectives and so on, and some people might find it's more important as a part of their practice than others. What they want to see is that you can communicate with drawing, and this can take lots of different personal forms. So in this episode, we're going to take you through some different formats of architecture drawing tasks you could be asked to complete and offer some advice on how you might begin to approach them. And at the end, we're going to give some general advice for good drawing practices at this stage of application, the do's and don'ts that can be applied to any drawing you might be asked for in an application. We're going to be talking lots more about drawing in future episodes of Talking Volumes and when we've had more direct experience of drawing as architecture students and understand its huge relationship to the subject more. So this isn't a definitive guide to architectural drawing by any means. It's just about the task at hand. Okay, let's have a look at some different drawing tasks. If we go from the lowest pressure to highest pressure and start with the task you submitted for Dundee, Ewan. Yeah, so this task is very non-prescriptive and spontaneous. And it's interesting to me because their first step is to go out into the area you live and start to look around you as an architect, which is something we've been talking about a lot. Yeah, they've got a list of themes to choose from and focus on while you draw, from surface, form, rhythm, repetition, scale, proportion, light, shade. So kind of vague visual features and textures you might see in your environment. And they ask you to complete six or more quick drawings while thinking about one of these things in your environment. And then, interestingly, they only ask you to upload your best three. So there's a couple important things to take from that brief. First, they want quick drawings. So they don't want to see entirely rendered, impossibly intricate scenes full of detail but they do want you to capture the core elements of the space you're depicting, particularly in relation to one of these themes. If I'm thinking about how to face that, and maybe I decided to focus on rhythm in a space, I might decide to go to a very dynamic, urban environment, and instead of delicately drawing the detailing of a space, I might instead take 10 minutes to capture the basic forms and then start using a different colour or medium over top to represent how people move through the space and how the rhythm of their movement works. And in that way, you're using drawing to capture something more than what your eyes are purely presented with but you're capturing something about time and the dynamism of a space. And that's just one idea, but the idea is that you're not just using drawing as a tool for perfect representation, but as a tool to communicate something, a kind of deeper level of information. So they're not looking for really developed architectural drawing skills, because you'll learn that on your course, but they won't see how you can think and communicate with drawing. The second thing I found interesting about this brief was that they only asked for three of your drawings, but suggested you should make at least six. So they're actually being pretty kind here and giving you the opportunity to curate your best work. Yeah, they want you to do well, so I guess this isn't something to be too stressed about, really. Have some fun with it. Okay, cool. Let's move on to the task we did for UCL. Yeah, of of all the tasks, this one's definitely the most intense, and it showed us the kind of philosophy of the Bartlett School, their very sort of art school-y take. We're just going to read from some of the text they sent us, but we're not going to list the specific theme they asked for us to respond to for a couple of reasons. First, it's very likely that the part of the task will change year on year. And second, as we're writing this, we've both insured the Bartlett and we don't quite know how happy they'd be with us if we publicly undermined their admissions process. Yeah, and I don't think we ever agreed to something saying we couldn't share this. But we're just going to try and strike a happy medium and cover things that we've heard from admissions tutors at Open Days and the summer school we did there. 
Okay, so the Bartlett asked for five A4 drawings as frames of a storyboard in response to a given theme. And I think that was a really interesting framing for this task. The word storyboard being thrown in there is key. It sort of indicates that your drawing should link up in some way, telling a story or showing a progression. It's almost like an illustration task. Yeah, and they expand on that by asking that your drawings explore multiple points of view, visual and conceptual at various scales. So they want you to draw from life, but at an imagined perspective. I think we both spent a lot of time just thinking about this task and trying to understand it after we got sent it. It's a really challenging but very exciting brief. They say you shouldn't draw from photographs, but from direct observation, and they should be personal, relating to a space, place or object in its context. And then they get really specific and say that at least two must be drawing in pencil, one in mixed media, and one of them should be a photograph. And then they give different timescales too. So one of them being five minutes, one being 15 minutes, one 30 minutes, and then an hour. And then this is the slightly weirder part. They said that one of the drawings had to be an interpretation of the image below. And they gave us an image of this really interesting, very architectural work of art from the 70s. They, they also say you should show how you understand it. Your response to this image might demonstrate your personal understanding and spatial interpretation of the work or investigate imaginary and playful tangents. And you can work directly onto the image or you can create an independent work inspired by it. And I remember at the summer school and Carlos, the lead tutor on it, giving a talk about the admissions process and the drawing task and saying the task was no big deal. And it would only take an afternoon because, you know, if you add out the drawing times, you get about two hours. And then let's say it takes an hour to take a photograph and an hour to post it off to them. And you're like, oh, that's four hours. But really, we probably both spent a lot of time just thinking about how we'd face it and meet all the really specific criteria and draw in all these different ways while still creating a storyboard of five images that was personal and interesting and coherent. Yeah, I think this can be a really a lot of work. I spent hours thinking about it and then I drew at the beach and I drew at college and I drew at home and I went out at night to shoot long exposure photographs in the dark and then I had to Photoshop them all together and then and then and that's before you've begun your portfolio for the Bartlett and they ask for another personal statement specific to the Bartlett. And I think that quite a lot of people just never hand in their task and never get an interview because of that. So I actually wouldn't worry about not getting an interview because your drawing task wasn't perfect. I think if you really get into the task and send it in on time, then you should be fine. I seem to remember from the, that same talk that Carlos gave, he said that about 1,500 students apply in total and 800 get asked for a drawing task, which is basically just everyone who's likely to meet the required grades. And then about 400 get interviewed for around 110 places. So you get three weeks to send this back to them. And I think our advice for this is to really carefully read the instructions they send you and think about a personal, interesting response you could offer it and plan out each of your five drawings in order with how long you're going to spend on each one and what media you're going to use. I also think it's really good to just be brave with it. I did one of my drawings with my eyes closed and I was a little bit worried about sending it in because obviously it didn't look very good. But at interview, it was actually definitely their favourite. We're going to talk about the actual drawing part for these at the end of the episode, but I really think the most important part here for getting an interview is just completing this and handing it into the brief, because they're also testing here whether you're really passionate and committed enough to put the work in. Okay, um, let's move on to the Cambridge tasks. These ones are interesting because they're done at interview, most likely in the morning before you have your portfolio interviews. And we're going to be talking about the interviews on our next episode, so let's just focus on this part of it first. The Cambridge drawing task is in some ways very non-prescriptive and in other ways a little more limited. You can find the specific paper on their website, but effectively you get taken somewhere like a room or a courtyard of the college you've applied to and you're given like a pencil, an A3 sheet of paper and a clipboard and then you have half an hour to draw with a pretty loose brief. You can draw whatever you want, they don't really give you any instruction at all. You can make multiple drawings or just one, you can draw through the windows, the outside, or you can draw the room you're in, and you might include people or you might not. And you probably won't be alone when you're doing this, but with other people who are also applying for this same place. In my interview at Fitzwilliam College, I was in a room with all 15 of that year's applicants, and we all knew that at most only two of us would be getting an offer. So basically it's a pretty high pressure environment. Before we get on to giving some advice on doing the drawing task, let's also talk about the writing assessment that you do at the same time. Yeah, so before the half hour drawing task, you also do a half hour writing task in response to an architectural question. The example question they have on their website is how can architects help the environment? And we both got given pretty similar questions in terms of scope and themes. Because the Cambridge course is quite academic, with lots of essays, lectures and a third year dissertation, they want to see whether you can write with clear expression, making competent arguments in writing, and really being able to evidence your thinking and interest around architecture, and how it influences other fields. All the things we mentioned in episode one, 
that's absorbing, observing, and making are all the resources you need in terms of content and thinking to be able to answer these questions. But being able to write an exam style essay is also pretty important. So maybe if you don't take a history or English big essay style A level, or you're doing an art foundation and might be a bit rusty, it might help to do a practice response to that sample question about how architects can help the environment. I think it's really important to take five minutes at the start to plan out and write down all the knowledge and themes you have that you might want to bring into your answer and then start writing. I wouldn't worry about having a convincing structure or a conclusion because you'll probably run out of time and it will just end and that's fine. Clear points made in strong paragraphs backed up by evidence will be a really great model for tackling this. However you choose to write, it's worth keeping in mind that they're mainly testing your writing skills here and not your knowledge of the subject. But of course, you're going to need to have something to write about, which will come into this. Yeah, of course, but that's fine. All that absorbing from episode one is coming right back here. Cool. Let's move on to some do's and don'ts for the drawing task. Let's start with the don'ts and keep the positive stuff at the end. Yeah, sounds good. And the first thing I'm going to say is very similar to what you've just said about the writing task, which is don't worry about finishing and fully resolving your drawings, especially in the Cambridge or Dundee style task we've talked about. Yeah, again, they're looking for the way you think visually and interpret and communicate space. So you need enough information down on the page to express that. But if you don't fully complete a drawing in the time you're given, there's really nothing to worry about. Yeah, and also, don't worry if you feel like you have to restart. Don't get rid of the drawing you started with or rub it out. Just choose the best one at the end. But slow down, keep calm, and start again. Yeah, that kind of leads to trying not to be intimidated. I know we set up the Cambridge task and the UCL one too as quite high-pressure situations, and they are, but you're only able to control what you can produce, so you can only really focus on that. Yeah, and for the same reason, it's really important to try not to look at anyone else's drawings while you're there particularly in the Cambridge scenario, where you'll probably be in the same space as other applicants. And there's probably going to be people who can do those perfect, photorealistic, intricate drawings. And I'm left sitting there thinking, oh my god, I'm just never going to be able to draw like like that. Yeah, exactly. But you've got to remember that they don't even expect you to be able to draw even nearly that well. It's great if you can do it, but it's even better if you're really showing your thinking. And if, like me, you definitely don't have those skills, then be confident in what you can do and how you can express yourself and your ideas through your drawing. Yeah, let's move on to some things you can do to produce a really strong drawing task, no matter your technical skills. So the first thing you can do, of course, is practice. For me, I knew that drawing would be the weakest part of my application. I had zero experience and zero skills, and I just didn't and still don't enjoy doing it that much either. So I really focused on practicing drawing for six months before my interviews. I did lots of live drawing classes, which help, but for architectural drawings, there's a few other really useful things you can be doing. Yeah, it's important to remember that they're not testing your technical skills, but it will help you make a good response if you've got some practice and some basic skills. Make sure you can do simple measured drawings with angles and straight lines. Maybe practice some simple one and two point perspectives and vanishing points. I liked drawing in 2H pencil for architectural stuff because it allowed me to keep my drawings clearer and simpler instead of the 2B of the art studio. You might totally disagree with me there though, and, and that's cool, I mean. No, I, I agree. Actually, I don't really. I, um, I've started doing a bit more pencil now, but I mm-hmm. usually work in like, when I was practicing for the Cambridge task, I was mainly working in pen. Oh, right. It translated okay to pencil, but like what I quite liked about that is that you literally can't rub stuff out. So at first, obviously, you're going to be a bit timid about using the pen and working in pen. But then eventually it just became like, oh, I can't rub this out. So I'll just like, you know, go for it. Yeah, but then okay. now I'm working in like a softer, slightly softer pencil, but not like quite 2B. I think you probably have more control as like than I do as well and, and have more ability to modulate that. Yeah. Like for me, working in 2H means that particularly for the Cambridge task, it was like when I went in thinking, OK, this is going to be really tough. I'm just going to sit down and try to resolve the form of what I'm looking at really accurately and clearly and just say i can see this building and i can define the form of it and i I wasn't thinking like okay i'm gonna add shading here i'm gonna make this line darker to emphasize it i wasn't really getting to that extra level of complication i was Mm -hmm. just showing i can articulate this space in 2d yeah and like that i think can be really hard and almost i think a big part of learning to draw is like learning to loosen up again and like draw like yeah, a child yeah. again in a way <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. because when you're yeah. so into like depicting something really accurately mm. it becomes quite hard to loosen up in that way and i think like the most interesting drawings to look at are the ones where they clearly know their perspectives and vanishing points mm-hmm. 
and they clearly know how to depict space, but they're almost going beyond that. And they're working really loosely and giving like the essence of a space. Some of my favorite life drawing classes would start with a movement drawing exercise, I think they called it, where the model would constantly be moving for like two minutes mm-hmm. and you would just track them with your pencil on the page. And the tutor in the lesson would never tell you what you should be focusing on or how you should be following their movement. And obviously the model's kind of rotating as they go. So you can't just focus on one joint. So I would be tracking an elbow as it arcs and then that would kind of come out of my view. So I'd have to flip that to it. But again, it does that thing of really loosening you up at the beginning of the session, which I think allows you to, to create more images with more feeling in them. Yeah, like not maybe not even thinking about like how it's looking in order to just make freer looking drawings. So it's almost like a bit of a paradox in that you don't want to care about how it's looking and then your drawing might probably look better. And things like things like sort of continuous line drawings and like blind drawing where you mm-hmm. don't look at the page, I find really useful to help me loosen up. Like sometimes I actually prefer doing a continuous line if I'm drawing like a person or something. I just find it literally easier. And I think using those techniques, if I think you like when you were going into these tasks, you definitely had more kind of control of your drawing. And I think doing those kind of exercises would have allowed you to show a lot more about your personal drawing practice, Mm -hmm. where for me, I was just trying to do like, this is enough. (laughs) I was just trying to get like, you know, minimum viable product of drawing and make that choice depending on how comfortable you are and, and the skills that you have. Exactly. And I think that doing that sort of drawing with consideration, particularly for the Cambridge and Dundee style tasks, will help to express what you find important in a space. Like if you aren't focusing on the surface textures of a space or don't think they're that important, then you can probably get away with not including them or keeping that detail minimal so it doesn't distract from what you're really focusing on. Just like in writing, clarity and simplicity will help to get your ideas across with fewer gestures and marks. Yeah, well, let's talk about some ways you can put some personality into your work here. The first thing, and we're going to say this again, is to cheat. Yeah, bend the rules. Architects are creative and always trying to bend planning rules to find better solutions. So read the rules really carefully and find what you can do within them. In my Cambridge drawing task, they didn't give me a ruler, but they also didn't say I couldn't use one, so I did. Gangster. All right, Liren. Okay, bud. (laughs) And no one paid any mind. And they supplied an HB pencil too, but I used my own one that I really liked because I'd be more comfortable using that. And it's also really important to surprise them. In my Cambridge task, it was really cold and we got taken to a courtyard to draw. And a lot of people in the group went over to the same corner to draw. So I took some time to look around and try and find a weirder perspective and take an uglier part of the space to look at. And this might have made my actual drawing outcome not like as strong as the others, but it guaranteed it would be different and would reflect exactly what interested me. Like with the writing task, it's definitely good to spend a bit of time thinking about what really interests you before you put pencil to paper. Yeah, and with my Bartlett task for the photograph page of the five, I used 10 or more long exposure light painting photographs and layered them in Photoshop to create a kind of Doctor Who intro scene like image. It's hard to explain without the photo, but I think it would have surprised the person seeing it and made them question how I made it. And I was also really stretching at the rules of what a photograph is. Yeah, so you're really showing like your personal interests, thinking and skills there. Yeah, and I think I had that with the photography in a way that I didn't yet with drawing. Well, in the last part of the episode, we're going to recommend some architects and artists to look at who we think use drawing in really interesting ways. This will hopefully give you some technical inspiration and some ideas on the massive range of conceptual approaches you could take. We'll have some images of their drawings and more artists and architects that we've been looking at on this episode's page on our website. We both really love Christo and Jean-Claude's drawings. They're really graphic and use composite photography to really cite the drawn elements in an exciting way. Yeah, for sure. Christo's drawings are like working documents and there's so much evidence of thinking and process in them. I feel like they aren't focusing on being a product in themselves, but this is actually why I think they're so interesting to look at. And they are in a way quite similar to Rachel Whiteread's really spatial drawings, but I feel like it's maybe not so much a part of her practice. Zaha Hadid's drawings are really interesting, of course. And what I really like about them is that it took a long time for engineering and technology to catch up with the forms she was drawing. Like when she was in the end of uni and stuff, she was creating these vast kind of dancing building forms that we now know as her signature in the buildings she's produced. But at the time, no engineer was able to come up with the like ability to actually construct them in real life yeah they're so conceptual and maybe in some ways not so applicable here but there is a really nice dynamism and fluidity to them 
And I actually quite like the painter Frank Auerbach's drawings for this too. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Auerbach. You are. Yeah. I think so, yeah. He sort of gives a really nice sense of space by layering loads of really loose expressive lines. And they're definitely not about getting across the logical information of a space, as architectural drawings often are, but I think they give much more of a sense of movement and the feeling of being in a space. I find it really fun to draw in that faster way sometimes, almost not even looking at the page and just trying to get down the main masses and volumes in my visual field with some energetic lines. Another Frank whose drawings give across a similar feel is Frank Gehry's, and these are really expressive ways of form finding, I think. And I do really like the looseness of his drawings, although maybe sometimes they're not so much about observation and more about creating a form. I think they're really just beautiful in themselves yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I think they really show how he thinks. Yeah, absolutely. I, there's there's such a perfect visual description of how he thinks about form in those drawings. Yeah. That's quite incredible. I really like Corbusier's drawings a lot too, even if they're almost antithetical to what you've just described about Auerbach's. He's not exactly known for his drawing, but there's something very clean and simple about them that's really effective at translating a space or a landscape. And there's a nice, almost cartoonish one of Algiers with a big line drawing the sun's path that I like that could be done by a child almost. And I really like how Frank Lloyd Wright uses sparse lines in colour too, and that could be interesting to look at. And Frank number four... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Rolling in at number four. We've number got four, Frank, Frank Ching. Ching. Um, We're keeping that, by the way. <laughs> and yet another Frank whose drawings, I think, get information across really well is Frank Ching's. And he has this really amazingly clear use of line. And the skill behind his drawings and illustrations of his book is just sort of mind boggling, mm -hmm. but also quite inspiring and a really good way of getting across space and just elements of architecture. And I also quite like Simon Unwin's drawings, which are a really good example of how you can think about the logic and layout of a building through drawing. And Simon Unwin and Frank Ching both have books on architecture filled with their own illustrations, which are really good reference books just for yeah. figuring well, out drawing. Again, we'll have some example of these and more on our website, talkingvolumes.co.uk. But I think that probably wraps up today's episode on drawing tasks. Yeah, let's just conclude with our main points on drawing tasks. They can feel really high pressure, but the most important thing you could do is complete them and hand them in on time. If you're not so confident with your drawing ability, keep things simple and clear on the page. And if you are more comfortable, then feel free to start showing more of your unique take, but don't lose the drawing's core. Great, and the next episode is the final one in this series, where we're going to have a slightly less formal chat about interviews, hopefully in the same room. Yeah, Ewan's coming down south for a few days, and after that episode, we'll be moving on to what will become our regular programming of stories about architecture from lots of different perspectives. And we really hope you stick around. This episode of Talking Volumes was produced remotely in Durham by me, Ewan Russell. And in Brighton by me, Ruben J. Brown. If you've got any questions, have a great episode idea, or want to get in touch for any other reason, please email us at talkingvolumespod at gmail.com or send us a message on Instagram or Twitter at Talking Volumes. If you want to refer back to the things we talked about today, you can find a quick summary at the episode's page on our website, talkingvolumes.co.uk, as well as some example images from some of our favorite drawings by architects. If you want to help our show reach more people, you can drop us a review on whatever service you're listening to and recommend us to a friend. Until next time, keep paying attention to the architecture all around you. See you in episode six, where we'll be focusing on the interview.